In 1976, just 44 years ago, two new additions came to Lidditz. One was me. 1976, I was born. Some of you are saying, well, wow, you're young. Some of you are saying, no, you're pretty old. The other addition, new addition, was the nativity in the Lidditz Square. If you don't know your Lidditz history, that's the year that the nativity came, uh, or this nativity came to the Lidditz Square. And some of you might remember back in 1993, some of you might have even been there um, for the protest in 1993 when the nativity made national news because the ACLU issued a notice for the nativity to be removed. And they said it shouldn't be di displayed on public property. And about 3,000 people showed up in protest holding candles saying we want to keep the nativity here. Uh, notice that year they weren't doing any social distancing. Did you notice that? In the end, the records showed that the nativity was not being displayed on public property, but that square was technically owned by the Lidditz Moravian Church. And so the nativity could stay where it was. But there was a lot of fuss to keep the characters of Christmas as the focus. Jesus, of course, is the main attraction. Christmas is all about Jesus. But the other characters of Jesus, uh, of Christmas, were important too for the nativity. Mary, Joseph, and you notice a few sheep as well. Our theme this year for Advent is the characters of Christmas. Last week, we looked at the character of Mary, and as you heard during the Advent reading, today we're looking at the character of Joseph. Joseph is often the forgotten character of Christmas. You think about every Christmas play you've ever seen, Joseph never has any lines. Do you ever notice that? They even sometimes give the innkeeper some lines, but Joseph never gets any lines. And you see, even throughout Scripture, J Joseph doesn't say a word, no quotes at all, but his actions speak louder than words, and he's a great example for us to follow. So here's the point of today's message is pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. Pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. Now that sounds simple, but it's, it's really complex. It sounds basic, but it's really very deep. It sounds easy, but it's really, really hard. It's really difficult to do. Pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. There's a couple um, that I know of from Connecticut, uh, Connecticut who um, they were millionaires. They had this big fancy mansion of uh, fancy cars. And uh, they went to a missions trip with Samara down to Dominican Republic uh, years ago and spent time working in a, an orphanage down there. Uh, this couple felt God telling them to sell everything that they had and move with their uh, four children down to the Dominican Republic and work at the orphanage. Now, do you think that was easy to do or difficult to do? To obey God, to pay attention to what God is telling them to do and to actually do it. People thought they were crazy, but they listened to what God told them to do, and they're missionaries down there today. Do you personally strive to pay attention to what God is telling you to do, and do you strive to obey what he's asking you to do? I want to challenge you this morning to be like Joseph to be like Joseph in that he paid attention to what God was telling him to do. And he obeyed when the angel told him to do different things in the dream, as we'll look, look at. All right, so before we get into that, who was Joseph? Who was he? What do we know about him? Let's just start with some basic facts about Joseph. Joseph lived in Nazareth. He was from Nazareth, or lived at the time uh, that we meet him in Scripture, in Nazareth, in the small town in Galilee, about 500 people. Joseph was also a descendant of David. 
His family was originally from Bethlehem in Judea. How do we know this? Well, Luke 2 verse 4 says, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He was a descendant of David. And in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, Joseph is called the son of David. Even though his father's name was really Jacob, he was called a descendant or a son of Jacob or uh, of David. And Joseph is the only other one other than Jesus in the New Testament with this title, son of David, as we read this morning. Joseph was also a carpenter, or perhaps a, another term is a builder. The Greek word is tekton. In Matthew chapter 13, people are wondering about Jesus, and they're wondering, like, who is this guy? And they say, isn't this the tekton's son? the builder's son, the carpenter's son. It's usually translated carpenter, but it's a general term used for all kinds of construction. He could have been a carpenter, a stonemason, a craftsman, a builder, a construction worker of some kind. Most homes, you think about it, most homes over in Israel aren't made out of wood. They're made out of stone or brick, um, mud, mud brick, not wood. So many, many people feel that uh, Joseph and Jesus was not a carpenter, but a stonemason. Remember, Jesus said, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So he referenced building with stone. But he also talked about the speck of sawdust being in your eye, as there would be in a carpenter's shop. Justin Martyr, around 150 AD, said that Jesus was a maker of plows and yokes which would be appropriate too when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. So Joseph perhaps was um, both a carpenter and a stonemason, and hence Jesus was as well. Either way, it's interesting that it says the carpenter's son, the tectone's son, which means there was probably only one in town and uh, everyone knew who he was. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Everyone knew the carpenter, uh, his son, the builder's son, the stonemason's son. And so what we know about this is Joseph is an ordinary guy. He's perhaps, he's just a construction worker. He works with his hands. He's the typical guy. And he was also poor. When Jesus was presented in the temple, Joseph and Mary sacrifice a pair of doves, of doves or um, a pair of pigeons instead of a lamb, showing that they weren't wealthy enough to afford a lamb. Another fact that we know about Joseph is he had other children. That same passage that we looked at in Matthew 13 said, and also in Mac, uh, Mark chapter 6, it says that the people of Nazareth were asking, isn't this the Tectone's son? And then they go on, aren't his brothers with us? James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. We know his brothers' names. Other, uh, Judas, otherwise known as Jude, changed his name because probably Judas, uh, you know, not being um, affiliated with the other Judas. And then it says, aren't his sisters, all of his sisters with us? Sisters plural, meaning he had more than one sister. So this verse shows us that Joseph had at least six children. Major theories on uh, this say uh, one is that um, the brothers were actually cousins. This is usually the Catholic uh, view because they believe that um, Mary was the perpetual virgin. And um, there's um, the problem with this is that the word that's used in Greek is Adelphos, which means brother. The city of brotherly love is Philadelphia, right? Del Delphos, which is the city of brotherly love. That's what the Greek word means. And so that doesn't seem to make sense. Another theory is that Joseph was much, much older than um, Mary, and he had children to a previous wife who had died. In some of the apocryphal literature, of, uh, according to the Gospel of Peter, for example, written about 150 AD, and the Gospel of James, it says that Joseph was married before 
and had children. They were all grown, and Jesus came much, much later. A third um, understanding of this is that Joseph and Mary simply had other children after Jesus. And this seems to make the most sense. Why? Because if you look at Matthew chapter 1, it says, before they came together, that is sexually before they came together, it implies that at a later point, Mary and Joseph did come together. And then later in verse 25, it says, Joseph had no union with her until her son was born. So most likely they had children afterward. In Luke chapter 2, it says, the time came for her baby to be born and she gave birth to a son. And then it says this, her firstborn. Now, why would it say firstborn if she didn't have a second and third and fourth born. So whether Joseph had children to an, a previous marriage or um, with Mary, we know that he had at least four sons and at least two daughters. So at least seven children, uh, if you include them, plus Jesus around in the home. And, and no wonder he's poor, right? You know, if you have seven kids that you have to feed, you know, you're, you're not going to have a lot of extra money. So that's some basic background on Joseph. Now, let's look more at his character. In the beginning, we said, uh, pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. How do we see Joseph playing this out? How do we see him paying attention to what God's telling him to do and obeying? Well, something I never noticed before as I read through Matthew chapter 1 and 2, and that is Joseph was a dreamer. I've noticed that before, but not, not how often he was dreaming. Do you ever notice this? As you read Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Joseph was like the Joseph of the Old Testament. Remember who Joseph was in the Old Testament? The, his brothers called him the dreamer, right? Well, Joseph in the New Testament was a dreamer too. And we're not talking kind of dreamer like Walt Disney was, oh, he's such a dreamer and he had such great ideas. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Not that kind of dream. Literally that God would speak to Joseph in dreams like the Joseph of the Old Testament. Three times in Matthew 1 and 2, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. How? In a dream. Three times. Did you ever catch that? It's not just once, it's three times. Actually, he has four dreams, but an angel appears three times. So all three times, an angel appeared to him in a dream. All three times, Joseph obeys what the angel tells him to do. And all three times, there's a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Let's look at the first dream that is found in chapter 1 of Matthew. The very first chapter in the New Testament, we see the character of Joseph. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, listen, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, have you ever had an angel of the Lord appear to you in a dream? Anyone? <coughs> okay. I see that hand back there. No, just kidding. Um, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Isn't that amazing? An angel appears to him and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus does. He saves us from our sins. All this took place. Why? To fulfill what the Lord had said. And here's the, the prophecy that was fulfilled through the prophet. And Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, the very next verse is awesome. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he had the honor of giving him the name Jesus. Now, did you notice some other things about Jesus? Some of the things that were mentioned already uh, during the Advent 
candle reading, Joseph was righteous. He was a righteous man. The Greek word can mean righteous or just or fair. It means someone who carefully follows the Old Testament laws. Someone who does the right thing. He has right conduct, right behavior. What was the right thing to do in this situation? Mary's pregnant. What is the right thing to do? According to the law, the right thing to do is to divorce Mary. Mary was pledged to Joseph. If you've ever seen the, the a musical Fiddler on the Roof, you remember Yenta is the matchmaker, and she's all about matchmaking, uh, arranging marriages, and getting them to the point where they're pledged to be married to one another. So this is a betrothal, much more important or a binding than an engagement. You can break off an engagement, but to break off a betrothal, there's only two things you can do. Is one, you can die, or two, you can get a divorce because this is a binding contract between two families. There's a, 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 a witnesses and there's a, an exchanging of gifts. And a girl was often betrothed right after she got her first period, usually around the ages of, of 12 to 13. And then about a year later, the groom would come to the bride's house and he would take the bride with bridesmaids and would go to the groom's house. And he would, they would have a big uh, ceremony and a wedding feast. Uh, Jesus refers to this tradition, if you remember, in Matthew chapter 25. He tells the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Do you remember that? And when the groom comes for the bridesmaids, do you remember there was five that were ready with their lamps and five bridesmaids who were not ready? And so th th this time of waiting between the betrothal contract and the, um, the wedding is about a year. So it, it's this time where Mary and Joseph are legally married. They could call each other husband and wife, in fact, but they're not physically married. And any righteous man during this period of time, if he finds that his wife is unfaithful, can divorce her. In fact, that's what a righteous person would do, a righteous man would do. And so, he, because he was a righteous man, he decided to fulfill uh, and not violate the laws and the customs of that time, and he was going to go through with the divorce. It was the right thing to do. But because Joseph was also a compassionate man, Joseph was a compassionate man, a kind man, he was going to do it quietly. He was going to minimize her shame. He could have exposed her and her family to public disgrace. But he was a man who was both filled with justice but was temper, tempered by compassion, mercy, and kindness. So he teaches us to do the right thing but also to balance justice with grace. So the angel says to Joseph, don't be afraid to go through with the wedding. And you can imagine he was afraid. Can you imagine this? What? My, my wife, we're not even officially, like, you know, physically married. Is she going to cheat on me again? Should I go through this? Can I trust her? She's pregnant. What are my friends and family and the neighbors, what are they going to all say about her? What are they going to say about me? They're going to say I didn't have self-control. The buzz around Nazareth is going to be, uh, did you hear that Joseph got Mary pregnant? Can you imagine that? And he knew that this is, this is what's going to happen. That's why he was afraid. His reputation was on the line. His carpenter business was on the line. But Joseph pays attention to what God is telling him to do. And he obeys even when it's difficult. Pay attention to what God's telling you to do. And obey even when it's difficult to do even when your reputation is on the line. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. He obeyed even when it was difficult, even when his neighbors and friends and family probably all thought he was crazy. Then, after that, Joseph and Mary go about 90 miles south from Nazareth to 
Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Because God ordained for the Caesar of Rome at that time to do a, a census. And Joseph goes back to his hometown. He has to register there, which is where? It's in Bethlehem. That's where he's from originally. So Jesus is born there in, Beth, uh, in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecies from the Old Testament that the Messiah would be from Bethlehem. And then Mary and Joseph go to the temple eight days later and they present Jesus to the temple. He has his name officially given by Joseph. His name is Jesus, which means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. And then they go back to Bethlehem for a few years. And while they're there, it says, that's when the Magi come, beginning of chapter 2. The Magi come they come, it says, to the house and not the, the stable anymore. They come to the house and they worship the child. So Jesus is no longer a baby. He's a child. The Magi come and Herod hears about all this and they want to kill. He wants to have Jesus killed. And now comes the second dream of Joseph. Look in Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 15. Here's the second dream. When they, that is the Magi, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The same thing. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Jesus had a target on him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled, here's the second fulfillment, so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, and now it's a quote from Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son. So Jesus went to Egypt to fulfill another prophecy. Again, notice the order. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream. He pays attention and he obeys right away. Joseph did what the Lord told him to do through the angel. He didn't go, oh, oh, that's, that's okay. Let me, let me just get some more shut eye. In the morning, we'll get our stuff together and we'll go. Notice what it says, verse 14. He got up, took the child and mother during the night right away, and they left for Egypt. Herod finds out that he's been outwitted by the Magi and orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem who are two years and under. That's how we know Jesus was around in that age. And he does that they, to fulfill another prophecy, which is in Jeremiah. Notice that Matthew is showing that when Jesus comes on the scene, all these prophecies are being fulfilled. Jesus arrives, and one prophecy is happening, happening over and over. Like, it's just left and right. All these prophecies are fulfilled because of Jesus. Now, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are in Egypt. And by the way, did you ever think of this, that Jesus was a refugee? He was a refugee in Egypt. While they're in Egypt, Joseph has his third dream. Check this out. And a, a fourth dream, in fact. One dream with an angel, the other one with no angel. Look at chapter 2, verses 19 to 23. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take his, the child's life are dead. Herod is dead now. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. Now get this again. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. Now look at this. Through the prophets, more than one prophet, he will be called a Nazarene. So Again, Joseph pays attention. He obeys right away. And this time, there's a fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies, plural, about him, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, what's interesting is nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, uh, even mention Nazareth. So the prophecies here are, are beyond just that he would be um, from Nazareth. He's an, uh, called a Nazarene, which... To be called a Nazarene meant that you were 
from nowhere that you were despised and rejected. Remember what Nathaniel said about Nazareth? He said, can anything good come from Nazareth? So, so this is a fulfillment that Jesus is going to be sort of like a nobody. Jesus is going to come from nowheresville, an obscure, despised, rejected place, nowhere on the map. Speaking of map, now check out, we've been sort of all over the map. Now check out this map where God has been guiding Joseph and Mary and Jesus. So they start in Nazareth. Look up north. They start in Nazareth. Then they go to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, Jesus is born. Eight days later, you see on the map, they go to the temple in Jerusalem to present Jesus. Then they go back to Bethlehem for a few years, and, to, and the Magi show up. Joseph has his dream there in Bethlehem. He's warned that Herod's going to kill Jesus. Then they go from there in Bethlehem to Egypt. An angel appears to him again in a dream, saying Herod's going to, uh, he's dead. You can go back to Israel now. He wants to go back to Bethlehem, but Herod's son is ruling in Bethlehem. So he says, well, he's warned in another dream, and he goes back full circle to Nazareth. Now what's awesome to see through this all is that Joseph is paying attention to what God is telling him to do. And God's guiding him because he's obeying what God tells him to do. We've looked at some facts about Joseph. He was a poor carpenter, a stonemason from Nazareth. He was a descendant of David. He was a righteous man who obeyed the law and yet filled with compassion. And he was a dreamer. And I want to camp on this last one for a little bit. He was a dreamer. I want to talk about dreams a little bit because I noticed this once again, that God speaks in dreams. And I believe he still speaks in dreams to some of us today. Joseph was a dreamer. You know, we as Christians believe this supernatural, don't we? Do you believe the Bible is true? Do you believe the Bible when it says a virgin conceived and gave birth? Do you believe when it talks about the miracles in the Bible? Do you believe that people really were healed by Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus really was raised from the dead? We believe that stuff, don't we? As Christians, we believe in the supernatural. And I believe sometimes, not always, sometimes God still speaks to us supernaturally through dreams. Are we paying attention enough, whether it's through dreams or another way that God is speaking to us? Are we paying attention enough to what God is trying to say to us? And are we obeying? I know there are times, I know there are times that God has spoken to me in dreams. I have a notebook and this is my notebook. You can see on the front if you can read. You probably can't read it from out there. It says dream catcher. And I keep this on my nightstand. And I started it back in 1904. <laughs> it was a long, long time. No, not 2004. Just kidding. 2004. And I write down uh, different dreams. And some of my dreams are crazy. I'll, I'll have to tell you some of them sometime if you want a good laugh. Um, some of them are just, I had one with an Amish guy fighting an Amish guy and stuff like that. And th there's some dreams that were clearly not God trying to speak to me. But there are some dreams that I know God was speaking to me. And I shared a story before. Um, and I'll share it again because it is... Uh, just an, an amazing, um, not, not story, it's amazing uh, truth that I believe God spoke to me through a, a dream. I mentioned this dream before, and it's so good I'm going to share it with you again. It's probably the clearest answer to prayer that I've ever had. Back in 2011, I was dating Samara, my now wife, but I was dragging my feet um, I was going back and forth. Should I marry her? Should I not marry her? I was really scared. I was engaged before. As we mentioned before, you can break off an engagement. I was engaged before. I broke off the engagement. Um, and I wasn't sure if marrying Samara was the right move or not. So I, I, was, I was just scared. I, you know, and my biggest concern was that she was so quiet. If you've ever met Samara... 
you don't get the impression that she's very loud and boisterous. Well, she can be at home when she's yelling at me, but, um, but you don't get that initial impression from her. So one night I was, I was really, really praying, Lord, should I, I don't know, should I marry her? I really, you know, I, I, I love her, but I, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I don't know. So I was on my knees praying, really, really praying more than I was praying uh, in a long time, just like praying, should I marry Samara? And that night I had a dream. And in my dream, a friend of mine, uh, his name is Rob Duff, he was a friend from my previous church, a friend of mine spoke to me in the dream. The only thing he said is this, 1 Peter 3, 4, and 5. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never, ever, before or since, I've never had a dream where I was given a specific verse now, what do you do when you're given a specific verse in, in a dream? You look it up. So that's what I did. I woke up and I turned to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I knew that at that point, you know, God's probably speaking to me when I had uh, a verse given to me in my dream. Okay, maybe God's speaking to me. And then it was more confirmed when I looked at the title of chapter 3 of 1 Peter. It's Wives and Husbands. Interesting. Okay, God, are you trying to tell me something here? I'm praying whether or not I should marry Samara. Okay, and then it was re really confirmed when, well, I, it's mostly confirmed when I read it. Because the thing that I was struggling with was whether, or, you know, she was just quiet. So here's what it says. Um, don't, don't focus on outward beauty uh, and adornment and things like that. But then it says, verse 4, Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is a, of great worth in God's sight. For this is how the holy women in the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. Now, if that's not a confirmation that I was to marry her, if you don't believe that, let me share the rest of the story. A few months, I will imagine, beforehand, I wrote a name in my Bible. I must have been reading this passage and I wrote one name right next to this verse. Anyone want to guess whose name it was? It's still right there. Samara. The only time I ever wrote her name in my Bible. I was reading this, it must have been months ago, before I had this dream, I wrote her name. And in my dream that night, as I'm praying, should I marry? Samara or not, a messenger comes and says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I look it up, Samara. Within a week, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> because I knew that was the Lord speaking to me. Now, I believe God does that kind of stuff. I believe God speaks to us in dreams. Does it happen often? No, I, I'd like to say that he speaks to me every night in a, in a dream, you know? It's not true. It's a rare occasion. I'd like to say that even every time that I hear the Lord speaking to me, that I obey. But that's not true either. You know, another clear dream that I have that was, um, I have written down October, I think it was 17th, in uh, 2014. I had a dream that I was at a dentist, and um, <laughs> yeah, and I looked in the mirror, and instead of teeth being there, it was just this like ugly, dangly thing hanging down, and I knew in my dream that it was like a tumor or something. It was like I looked ugly, and uh, just like all my teeth were rotten out, and I remember, and I had it written down, it's too late for me to eat fruits and veggies. And I wrote, don't you get it? I'm dying. 
And I woke up in a panic. And I, I truly felt the Lord is trying to tell, tell me, you better get your act right, not eat so much candy, not drink so much soda, and start eating more fruits and vegetables because you could die if you don't change your lifestyle. And it, for about two weeks, I changed my lifestyle. I didn't drink soda or iced tea. I wasn't eating candy, junk food, and stuff like that. And then I'm ashamed to say, I just slowly went back. You see, there's an example of a time where I, I clearly heard from the Lord and I obeyed. And another time where I clearly, I feel, heard from the Lord and I obeyed for a little while. But obeying is tough, isn't it? And I'm guessing I'm not alone. I'm guessing God has told you to do something. And maybe you've obeyed for a little while, but then you stopped. Or you sort of drifted away. I'm guessing that God has spoke to you about something. And it was so difficult that you said, I'm not sure if I can do that. I don't know if I can give up certain things. You, you see, obeying... We might think is easy, but it's really, really difficult. And what I love about Joseph is he obeyed even though his reputation was on the line. He obeyed even though it was difficult. Please pray for me in this regard with this uh, eating candy and uh, junk food and drinking soda. It's really, really hard for me. It really is a struggle. You see, even when God clearly speaks to us, don't we all at times, he clearly speaks to us but we say, oh man, that's so hard. I don't know if I can do that. Or I can do it for a little bit, but I don't know if I can keep up the pace. So here's the application for us today. For you and for me, pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. Maybe God's trying to speak to you through a dream and maybe you need to, to get a dream catcher and just start noticing, paying attention to some of your dreams. And again, not all dreams are from God, but all like sometimes you notice that God is trying to get your attention like with uh, me with uh, the dentist one and, and definitely the one with uh, Samara. Maybe God's trying to talk to you through dreams. Pay attention and obey. Maybe God's trying to talk to you through his word, the Bible. Pay attention and, and obey. Maybe through prayer, his Holy Spirit speaking to you. Maybe through another mature believer. Pay attention and obey. Like Joseph, be attentive. A, a, a sensitive to what God is trying to tell you to do. Pay attention and obey, even when it's difficult, even when your reputation's online, even when you're afraid of the outcome. Pay attention to what God is telling you to do and obey. Let's pray. And right now, just talk to the Lord. And maybe he, he's been trying to tell you something for a long time and you've been sort of saying, okay, God, I know you want me to do this, but you haven't been obeying. Right now, pay attention. What is God saying to you? What does he want you to do? The question is, will you obey even though it's difficult. Lord, we thank you for Joseph, his example. Help us to be righteous men and women, tempered with mercy and compassion. Thank you for this reminder that you use ordinary people, construction workers, and uh, ordinary people who join you to do extraordinary things. And Lord, teach us to pay attention to what you're telling us to do whether it's through a dream, through your word, the Bible, through the Holy Spirit nudging us, through other believers trying to tell us something, teach us to pay attention to what you're trying to say to us and give us the courage and the fortitude to obey even when it's difficult. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.